Ira Takuto experienced death and felt the consciousness falling into darkness, losing his sanity even though his incurable illness and death at the age of 18 felt tragic. Takuto felt peaceful when he found happiness and the wonders of the game during his last few years, but his consciousness returned with a confused feeling. Takuto opened his eyes and found himself in a strange place with fresh air and a newfound freedom of body. This sensation was very different from his experience in the hospital that made him feel oppressed. Here, Takuto realized that his body could move freely, something that was previously impossible due to his illness. His new life after death gave him a pleasant experience, unlike his life that was limited by his illness. As Takuto began to feel the joy of his newfound freedom, a girl's voice startled him. He was also surprised to see the girl in front of him, believing that she was like the promised angel who would guide him to the afterlife. However, the girl's appearance did not match his expectations. The girl was a character from his favorite game, Eternal Nation. Takuto was shocked and almost couldn't believe that the game character came to life before him. Nevertheless, the girl responded to Takuto with a pleasant smile, acknowledging himself as the king in the game. Mixed feelings filled Takuto's mind, even though the protagonist still didn't fully understand his new situation. The protagonist realized that his favorite game character, Takuto, whom he admired so much, was now standing right in front of him in real life. The main character realized that if the girl in front of him called him king, the main character had no choice but to behave according to that role. Takuto was confused by the situation, especially as the main character tried to understand how he should act as a king. However, a small smile from the girl made him feel powerless, even though previously a smile like that would make the medical staff panic. Now his body was no longer frail like before. Then the girl gave surprising information to Takuto about her success in the game. The main character, who was left behind in the previous world, managed to become the champion in the game with the country of Manobra, which was considered difficult to use. This made him a legend among the players of the game and became the place where Takuto found his self-worth, especially when his life in the real world felt lonely and neglected by his family. All of these achievements were because of the presence of the girl in front of him, who was named Atu, a character in the game. The success in the game was the result of his dedication and escape from his loneliness, and Atu played an important role in those achievements. Atu revealed that she remembered all their experiences together in the game, recalling all the moments when they conquered the in-game world and how often they experienced defeat. Although the words sound flat, Takuto felt hidden emotions behind them, making his chest filled with various feelings at that moment. Just to make sure that he remembers it well, Takuto could barely hold back his emotions. Those words almost made him cry, even though the main character tried to hide his emotions. The main character struggled to express his feelings with the right words. Both of them questioned where they are now, to show that the place feels more like the eternal nation's world than heaven even though it may seem cliché. The main character was happy to meet him in that place. Even though Takuto felt happiness in this meeting, the main character realized that his life is no longer bound by the limitations of the disease that made him constantly think about death. Now, his life needs a purpose, and Atu's presence inspires him to find a new purpose in life. Atu invites Takuro to start rebuilding something together. Atu offers the opportunity to start a kingdom like they did in the past game, even though they are now in an uncertain world. Takuto is impressed by his simple desire and loyalty to that goal, but seeing him with elegant and dark eyes, Takuto can't help but feel afraid. The main character feels touched by Atu's presence, the character he likes the most in the game, an important and highly admired person to him, even though he was initially surprised by by request to build a kingdom. Takuto finally agreed. Takuto, who had previously lived with an incurable disease and felt hopeless, now had endless possibilities in this world and the afterlife. The main character felt a freedom they had never experienced before. Both characters then made a contract between them, with Takuto firmly stating their desire to fall together. Takuto gave their body and heart to Takuto as their king through the contract's unique words. 
Takuto, who had seen this in the game, reaffirmed their loyalty to Takuto after completing this ritual. Both of them felt a little embarrassed, but more than that, they felt happy with the decision they had made. Although they felt somewhat awkward, they laughed together and began to feel like new people. However, the seriousness of their situation quickly returned when the maneuver leader gave their first order to start the game with high spirits. They understood the policies and playing style they would use to govern this country, because this knowledge had long been ingrained in their minds from previous matches. Although they officially declared their country as the evilest, they were more focused on strong domestic politics rather than their ambitions for war. They chose to highlight their abilities in domestic policies that benefited their civilization in terms of stability and domestic wealth, while minimizing the benefits of military conflict. After the declaration of their civilization's establishment, they turned to their first internal meeting to plan their initial steps and make suggestions to Takuto on using emergency production and their current situation. Emergency production is a method of quickly creating units or buildings using magical resources that are commonly managed together. When Takuto asked about the amount of magical power they have, they realized that Takuto has about 200 magical powers in the context of the game. This number represents the resources they have. Takuto plans to use their magical powers wisely, knowing that producing combat units is not possible with the resources they have. However, when the summoned creature appears, Takuto and Atu are disappointed with its appearance and criticize the appearance of the unit named Longlebug. Although it is part of their demolition force, they feel that its appearance is not convincing. Atu reveals that he is only familiar with its unnamed appearance, not its physical form. They interact with the long-legged insect, albeit with disgust and discomfort, trying to adapt to the situation they are experiencing. They give the creature orders to investigate its surroundings. Takuto feels a little relieved with the cooperation of the creature, realizing that communicating with this insect gives them access to useful information for their future adventure. Takuto feels how the main character is able to synchronize his vision with the long-legged bug allowing him to map the surrounding area better. This makes him laugh because it is a similar experience to what the main character in the game Atu goes through. The main character has higher fighting abilities than the long-legged bug, but still low enough to make them vulnerable when facing enemies. They are aware of the risky situation they face, especially when confronted with real threats. Although their frustration and worries have subsided a bit, the encouragement from Matt has become a source of motivation for them. The long-legged insects help them understand most of the terrain around them, but the presence of dense forests makes it difficult to see clearly or detect wild animals or monsters around them. They feel strange because they can't find any demons or wild creatures, but this doesn't stop them from investigating their surroundings. Despite feeling like he can't help, Takuto gently encourages and comforts a two, while also saying it casually. The protagonist realizes the importance of his words behind his polite nature towards Harbor, deeply admiring Takuto as a king and accepting everything he says to heart. In turn, Takuto begins to realize the sincerity of his feelings towards him. Although surprised, the protagonist is touched by his admiration. The main character understands that Ato is a sincere person, despite his background as an evil hero. His attitude makes him a pleasant and cheerful person. Takuto reflects a unique personality in the game setting, but the protagonist struggles to get a clear picture of who he really is or what his characteristics are in the game at that time. To interrupt his contemplative thoughts, Takuto is immediately surprised and his confusion disappears even though his heart is pounding fast. The protagonist tries to hide his reaction. Atu is unaware of Takuto's emotional state, trying to make sure that everything is fine with him when the long-legged insect, it gives a report. Takuto immediately focuses and starts describing the image that appears in his mind. They realize that they have found a dark elf settlement that gives them some clues about the world they are exploring. Takuto estimates that the dark elves, although called evil race, actually have neutral attributes that make him feel that the place is quite safe. However. They feel the need to remain cautious and careful. Although the Dark Elves may not be their enemies, 
They discuss the possibility of negative consequences if the land is indeed a territory or borders with that country. Takuto and Atu, with a slightly tense atmosphere, plan to continue monitoring the Dark Elves and gather more information. They agree that if the situation worsens, they will immediately flee. Despite planning for security, their excitement and enthusiasm cannot be contained. They are like children engaged in an exciting adventure. However, their cheerful atmosphere suddenly stops when they hear a rustling sound and see a group of people staring at them with sharp gazes. Atau showed a sharp attitude that was very different from their usual demeanor, indicating that the previously calm situation suddenly became serious and potentially dangerous due to the arrival of these people. Takuto immediately focused in the same direction as they realized the presence of the imposing leader of the Dark Elves, who was by the neighboring country because he used to be very powerful. However, Gia appeared thin and weak, as if he had lost his strength. Gia and his followers looked very frail and tired as they entered the gloomy and dark forest, but it seemed like they couldn't find anything. Gia seemed to have ventured further into the forest, and his subordinates advised him not to continue exploring because it seemed like they couldn't find anything, and their condition was worsening. Although Gia wanted to give up, he talked about finding food for his followers. However, the eerie atmosphere in the forest made them feel oppressed. Despite Gia's physical strength declining, he still tried to give directions to his followers, showing that he was still responsible for their fate in this forest. Gia's story about the cursed forest and the potential presence of something evil did not shake Gia. Gia rejected those stories as superstitions, remembering the lush and abundant life they had experienced in the forest. Nevertheless, Gia still inspired courage in his followers, showing his firmness and mental strength as a warrior leader. Gia was respected for his expertise and extraordinary mental strength. Even though it felt like they were trapped in darkness, they believed that Gia would lead them through the difficulties. Their courage grew, thanks to Gia's strong words, and they continued to move forward through the darkness they had never seen before. Gia encountered something that his logic couldn't explain. He saw an entity that seemed to emerge from ancient stories or myths told by his aid. This figure evoked fear and appeared like an evil manifestation described in stories passed down from generation to generation. It reminded Gia of the destruction and chaos that could occur. This entity emitted an aura that made Gia feel cautious and afraid. His discomfort deepened when he realized that his actions could affect the fate of his race. In an effort to calm the situation and show respect, Gia declared his identity as the leader of the Sour Clan and apologized for entering the forest without permission. Although Gia tried to demonstrate peace and regret for his actions, the mysterious circumstances and the presence of this entity still caused anxiety and raised significant questions in his mind. In front of him stood a figure that felt unusual, making him unsure of how to proceed in this increasingly unsettling situation. Their attempts to explain the reason for their presence in the area were met with an entity that showed no emotions or predictable responses. Gia tried to explain that they came from a persecuted and forced to leave homeland, but in explaining their suffering, he felt a mistake. This small mistake made us feel extremely pressured, because their fate now rested in the hands of this mysterious entity, as Gia was about to apologize for his wrongdoing. Suddenly the entity spoke, sounding like a young voice, but without any emotions or signs of life. Its strange presence instilled fear among them, causing Gia and his followers to tremble and feel uneasy. The entity's question startled Gia, leaving him in a state of extreme fear. Gia couldn't find a way to interpret the entity, and his confusion deepened because its presence was far from what he expected. However, Gia's fear only grew. He felt powerless and afraid for the fate of his subordinates and colleagues in his increasing panic. Gia heard a sound rolling in front of him, and his anxiety reached its peak when he thought it might be the sound of his own head falling off his body in unbearable fear. Gia closed his eyes. The once feared warlord now trembled in fear of the dark elves, whose lives were often filled with oppression and exile. They lived in a place untouched by light, isolated and ignored by many other races. Gia had accepted this unfortunate fate as part of their lives, but suddenly, 
The presence showed them a compassion they had never experienced before. When Jia opened his eyes, he found that his neck was fine, but in front of him lay fresh and ripe red fruits with a sweet and luxurious aroma that tickled his nose. The presence provided a brief answer to the existence of the fruits. The fruits had a shape that Jia had never known before. As far as their knowledge went, fruits were usually small and hard with a hint of sweetness and a more dominant bitter taste. However, the fruit in front of him was different. Its gentle aroma suggested a tempting sweetness, and its bright red color caught Jia's attention, urging him to eat it immediately. When Jia picked it up, he was surprised by it. The fruit is big, dense, and hollow, as if it can only be eaten by nobles, even though he doesn't fully understand what the former resistance conveyed. Jia understands that the fruit is called an apple and can be eaten, but Jia is confused about whether he can eat it in that place and worried that it will be considered impolite. Besides, Jia also remembers her hungry comrades in the camp, although he is unsure. Jia sees that his team members have already eaten the fruits before she made them. Despite being tempted to do so, Jia chooses to restrain herself for a moment and glances at the strange presence. However, deep down, Jia still wants to remind them to be more polite when eating fruits, especially when a rolling pear is in front of them. Jia has never seen it before. The green fruit has a different sweet aroma compared to an apple. Although its surface is still raw, the fruit looks appetizing. Jia picked it up with confusion in her mind. She was frustrated because she didn't understand the thoughts of that strange entity, but Jia tried to explain that there were many refugees, including hungry children. Jia wanted to give the fruits to those children, but in the midst of her desire to help, Jia felt a rusty taste in her mouth, perhaps due to the overwhelming feelings of anxiety and tension in this critical situation. Jia knew that they didn't care about their situation, but he still held on to his determination to bring back the food, no matter what happened. Jia showed a strong resolve, ready to fulfill his mission, even if it involved great risks, and his wish came true when the presence said, unfortunately, in a very emotional state. Jia was surprised when a pile of food appeared around the presence, witnessing other fruits that he had seen before, large round potatoes, grains of wheat, and soft pieces of bread that could change shape if tears fell like a waterfall. It was a great act of kindness, even though its presence was not directly related to their race. It created a mountain of food to help Jia and his companions. The story continued with a dramatic scene at the end of the day, where the dark elves in the emergency camp were almost dying of hunger and despair. There were about 500 people there, mostly women, and they all looked amazed and desperate. Even the cries of babies were starting to fade due to their weakened condition. But in the midst of this seemingly hopeless situation, a sudden change occurred. At first, they were about to give up on the bleak situation. But suddenly a voice announced good news. He saw myself once again witnessing a miraculous sight unfold before their faces. The faces that had once seen death and despair. They lit up with joy as they started eating and saving food for the soldiers who had fought relentlessly. Life was brought back to life amidst the noise and excitement as the previously critical group was finally saved by the return of their leader with the help of food. Unstoppable joy overwhelmed them thanks to the abundance of food they had, more than enough to fill their hungry stomachs. After the chaos subsided, the remaining food was sorted and carefully stored. The silence of the night replaced the previous commotion, and many of them slept peacefully, resting after a grueling period of hunger. The only sound that could be heard in the quiet night was the crackling of the empty pot over the firewood as long as they managed to survive the long and hopeless night of tormenting hunger. Gia revealed that deep in the forest, he had found something that only appeared in legends, something immense and powerful. The elder Moltar's question about why the King of Destruction provided food without any reward caused confusion. There was no clear understanding of why such evil deeds occurred. The entity would act in a way that did not align with their description of the evil depicted by the King of Destruction when Jia expressed his concerns about the possibility of being deceived by the Elder Moltar. He explained that what they received was a form of grace, and they blamed each other. 
However, in the end, Elder Moltar finally realized that Gia was indeed speaking from her heart, even though she was referred to as the King of Destruction. It seems that Takuto has empathy and clear concern for those around him. In that scene, we are presented with an image of Takuto appearing careless and making a decision that wastes his magical power, which should have been well preserved. However, the prominent aspect of Takuto's humanity is when the main character apologizes to his subordinates who seem annoyed by his careless actions. Takuto has tried to apologize and change the atmosphere, but he seems to have a little difficulty in overcoming their anger and dissatisfaction. This shows that Takuto's humanity is imperfect and sometimes unable to overcome the anger of his subordinates. The interaction between Takuto and Atu depicts the dynamics of their relationship, which is not solely based on Takuto's position as the king of destruction. There is a strong aspect of humanity where Takuto tries to apologize for his mistakes, and Atu, although unsatisfied, also shows concern and regret towards Takuto. In the context of their relationship, Atu seems to have a deep dedication to Takuto, and even his principles are fully focused on Takuto, and his caring attitude makes him vulnerable to Takuto's decisions or requests, even when he is annoyed. Atu can quickly calm down when Takuto apologizes or says sweet words. On the other hand, Takuto also seems to care about their relationship and considers it important to obtain approval in the decisions he makes. This shows that even though he is the king of destruction, Takuto also prioritizes his personal relationship with Atu as an important priority. The story brings up emotional tension when it is revealed that the main character has difficulty communicating, which was initially hidden. It is then revealed that Takuto has a communication disorder that hinders him from effectively speaking to others, even in front of nurses or doctors at the hospital. His reaction shows a strong sincerity, concern, and empathy towards Takuto. Atu responds anxiously and tries to calm Takuto's fear. Takuto, who is crying, shows his deep attachment to the situation and his feelings. Both the teacher and his friend provide strong and enthusiastic support, promising to be his voice and support him throughout his life. However, when Atu offers support and suggests starting a new life, Takuto instead feels desperate and doubts himself, making it hard for him to try to erase his sadness. The sadness of the two people in that intimate moment is interrupted by the presence of a long-legged insect that seems incapable of reading the situation. Takuto quickly releases the hug and tries to return to his solitude on the rock, although he appears slightly annoyed by the disturbance. Atu feels in a bad mood when the long-legged insect mentions that the dark elves are approaching to take Takuto away. He quickly understands that the behavior of the long-legged insect is due to their game situation. The tension reaches its peak when Takuto feels anxious about negotiating with the Dark Elves. Meanwhile, Atu offers to take over the task, showing impressive confidence. When the Dark Elves arrive and their leader, Mort Quarter Mazam, introduces himself, the atmosphere becomes tense. Atu displays a calm and confident attitude in front of Moltars and others who are dark even though the Moltars show politeness and apologize to Atu. Atu feels that he is not so bothered by education or rigid politeness. Atu sees Takuto as a modern and simple person, and his concern is more focused on whether Takuto is upset or not when the Moltars ask for his name. Ato looks for Takuto to seek his approval, highlighting the relationship of trust and respect they have for each other, even though they have never met before and his name has never been mentioned. This indicates that Takuto still has many mysteries to solve about the people around him. Here, there is a change in attitude towards the disclosure of Takuto's identity. Previously, Atu thought that providing additional information to outsiders could cause problems. However, over time, Atu began to see that it is better to take risks to live according to his desires, rather than living in fear. This affects his decision to allow the disclosure of Takuto's name to the Dark Elves when Atu officially announces his name. An interesting response from an old man among the Dark Elves who trembles when the name is spoken. Takuto notices the old man's reaction, showing his attention to the unusual situation. Atu also sets clear boundaries in addressing Takuto by requesting that he not use the same title and stating that their statuses are different. 
This shows respect and recognition for Takuto's position of power as the admired Supreme King. Even though there are concerns among the old men of the Dark Elf about revealing their names, they are willing to carve the name Takuto on their old bones and immortalize it in their souls as a promise. Atu's previous boredom in talking or negotiating with anyone other than Takuto is evident. The time spent communicating with others is considered a waste. He wants to end the negotiations quickly and earn praise from his master. But his mood changes when the Dark Elf leader suggests honoring Takuto as a reward for his safety. Atu feels disturbed by this idea as it contradicts his imagination of Takuto as a kind-hearted person. Atu tries to ascertain what Takuto wants or if there is a desire for it. However, the Dark Elf leader admits their ignorance of Takuto's desires and the difficulty they face in imagining them. They want to hear what Takuto wants as a starting point. Atu quickly rejects the idea of paying tribute because he realizes that as food-deprived refugees, they have nothing valuable or precious to offer. Takuto also has no intention of letting the conflict continue in such conditions. The main character finally decides that he must intervene, but when he tries to speak, a small mistake makes him stutter, and his voice immediately sounds displeasing. Atu approaches Takuto to speak privately and expresses his disappointment with the futile negotiations. The situation becomes tense when Atu realizes that killing a group of dark elves using a reverse katana is not difficult for him. Even though Atu is aware of the ethical consequences of killing them all, it would benefit himself, and Takuto is desperate with the worsening progress of the negotiations. Atu misunderstood the situation from the beginning and initially disliked exchanging words, but acted as a mediator for his master's sake. Atu wanted to end the conversation quickly to resolve all the issues. However, for the Dark Elves, these negotiations were their last and first choice. They realized that this was a turning point in their destiny that would affect their fate, even if they survived this situation. Their specific concerns were the lack of food and the uncertainty of finding a new place to live. Takuto felt interested in continuing to interact with them and wanted to enjoy the negotiations. For him, this was an opportunity to communicate with others, something rarely done by the main character before. Despite the main character's communication problems, Takuto felt compelled to fully entrust the negotiation process to ATU and quickly continued the negotiations without realizing Takuto's true intentions. However, there was something unusual in his tone of voice that made the group of elves bow their heads. Atu commented in a casual and teasing tone, creating the impression that they saw Takuto as an evil spirit wandering in the mountains. But Takuto insisted that his words were absolute and ensured that the Dark Elves did not underestimate their wisdom. Takuto gave permission to provide weapons without any contract, ending the meeting in an unexpected way and proposing tribute as a reward from the Dark Elves. Elder Moltar didn't want to argue with him through speculation, because denying it would be seen as disrespectful to the king. Instead, Elder Moltar simply expressed his gratitude to the counter, and then compensated Ed as needed to fulfill the contract. His expression shifted to show a hint of annoyance, although unspoken. Takuto could sense what he wanted to convey, like a plea for help. However, despite boasting earlier, Takuto realized that if the main character got involved, it would only harm their reputation. Takuto understood that now was the right time to settle the negotiation as a supporter without direct interference. Takuto then shifted the conversation to express his interest in the outside world and asked for information from the Dark Elves, as well as exchanging food tributes. This made Moltar agree to provide the information they had, so at this stage, the negotiation was almost reaching its end. However, there was an interesting moment that surprised Takuto when Elder Moltar stated that they could stay for a while after the contract was completed. Takuto saw confusion in Moltar's attitude. He still didn't pay attention to their response and Takuto's attitude began to speculate the reasons behind the actions of the Dark Elves that they seemed to be doing. They needed permission to stay temporarily in the forest to rest, especially due to their difficult living conditions. However, Takuto also realized that they shouldn't stay too long as it would cause further problems, 
especially in the formation of a temporary nation. While the Dark Elves requested permission to stay in the forest, Takuto insisted that the land was his, and he wanted peace. Atu emphasized that if they didn't want to sacrifice the new opportunity they had obtained, it would be best for them to leave the place. So in this part, the story delves deeper into the impact of the curse. The evil nation of Lobra's status and its influence on the neutral attributes in the game are explored. The negative effect is that the neutral attribute unit's status will become negative, and there is a tendency to favor the evil race. Although Takuto allows them to try to remove the Dark Elves from the forest, the main character also feels uneasy about the choice to leave them after providing food to Elder Moltar and the accompanying Dark Elf warriors. It seems like they are afraid to ask for anything else, fearing Takuto's anger. Takuto feels that as the main character and king of Minogra, he should have unlimited power to easily solve problems like this. The main character questions why Takuto doesn't use his power to help them. Before Takuto finds another way, which the main character thinks is better to solve this problem, inviting the Dark Elves to become their allies, Ato won't stop there. Atu wants to make sure the true meaning of Takuto's statement and steer the conversation in the right direction. Frustrated with the misunderstanding, Takuto tries to make his intentions clear. The main character says that his plan is to accept the Dark Elves as refugees, not as citizens. However, the main character realizes that this can cause problems between the Dark Elves and the main homunculus race, because different races are usually assigned to different civilizations. Takuto provides a deeper explanation about homunculus. Homunculus is a race that has certain advantages in terms of high fertility and excellence in food resources and productivity. However, its shortcomings lie in the low production of magical power and weaknesses in technological development, as well as the inability to engage in aggressive expansion. It is important to note and understand the explanation of homunculus, but it is also scary to realize that the appearance of homunculus is reminiscent of a long-legged insect-like figure hiding behind the dark elves, with its strange and terrifying form. From their homunculus, they realize that Homunculus is created as a clone that imitates humans, but with a very unpleasant appearance to others. In this part, Takuto muses about the advantages and disadvantages of Homunculus as a protagonist race. He realizes that the Homunculus used by the protagonists have high production capacity and fertility, but they have less happiness and low cleanliness as a punishment. However, they have an advantage in brute force production— while their weakness lies in low research power. The protagonist realizes that by inviting the pitiful Dark Elves to their country, they can overcome the weaknesses in research and development. By bringing them to the country, they can reduce the gap and develop new technologies. It is said that the King of Destruction plans to establish a kingdom. The King of Destruction offers protection and love to the Dark Elves if they are willing to become citizens of the new country. The Dark Elves are shocked by this unexpected offer, as it surpasses what they have prepared in their simulations and negotiations with the King of Destruction. There was a clarification from Takuto to the Dark Elves regarding the decision that had been conveyed by the King of Destruction, Takuto, to clarify that they would become evil if they became citizens of the newly established nation, although the expression was too blunt and sharp. The Dark Elves understood the meaning contained within it. The Dark Elves prepared to welcome the arrival of Takuto, whom they knew as the King of Destruction. They anticipated a moment full of tension, feeling the weight of the decision they made two days ago when the King was about to come to their sacred place. Their mood reflected deep hope and fear. The Dark Elves prepared very carefully and decided to restrain themselves by kneeling on the ground choosing not to look directly at the king based on the instructions from their elder Moltar. They were aware of the importance of not provoking the king's anger. However, some of the young dark elves were unable to contain their curiosity and lifted their faces, quickly regretting their actions due to great fear when Takuto or the king of destruction began to appear. The atmosphere became very tense, and the dark elves felt a very strange presence there. There were distortions and black stains formed around Takuto, creating an indescribably eerie atmosphere. 
Hearing the king's decision, they nodded and gave permission, stating that they were now citizens of Minogura. However, the atmosphere remained tense after the announcement made by the newly accepted Dark Elves. They did not feel a change into evil creatures, confusing them. They experienced confusion about what to do next, whether to perform a special ritual or wait for further instructions. Takuto and his subordinates seemed motionless, allowing the tense atmosphere to subside in silence. However, among the dark elves who had just become citizens, there was an inexplicable feeling, a peak of anxiety and confusion. They were trembling and burning with anticipation. Due to deep emotions, they feel a burning hatred and anger towards those who have hurt and persecuted them. However, despite this anger, the voice of King A.A. Takuto brings them to question and understand the hidden truth behind the king's attitude and actions. They realize that from the beginning, King Takuto had no intention of harming them. The food and affection he provided were not meant to ask for anything in return. He was only watching over them with concern, observing how they restrained themselves and kept their spirits under control. This realization brings great relief to the Dark Elves. They return to their usual place outside the Dark Elf village, and in their conversation, it can be seen that they are burdened by something. Their expressions show tension and worry about the future that awaits them as they prepare for their departure. Conversations about their new country reveal unsettling realities. They realize that despite their country having evil attributes surrounding them, they are a powerful nation that may have potential enemies. They consider the two neighboring great nations with humans and elves as potential adversaries. They find that although these nations are kind-hearted creatures, both have strong hegemony and a wide presence. However, the situation becomes more complicated when they realize there are unknown territories, unexplored continents, and unidentified potential. The enemy proved to be a bigger challenge than they had anticipated. Their frustration grew as they realized that the surrounding territory had no resources they could utilize to strengthen their new nation. They discovered that potential enemies like Dakai had no productivity or significant resources. This became the cause of the hunger felt by the Dark Elves, leaving them feeling hopeless and desperate. When Elder Moltar returned and was willing to explain about the world that couldn't be discussed in the tense atmosphere, it alleviated some of the previous uncertainty. The presence of Gia, the leader of the warriors, and his knowledgeable and informative who specialized in intelligence, provided much-needed knowledge and information from other countries. There were also efforts to help the Dark Elves understand this. Their loyalty is not just an attitude, but also an emotion that doesn't have to be shown through rigid or formal actions. Takuto, who is accustomed to a more relaxed and casual closeness, wants to explain that true loyalty doesn't always have to be manifested in specific rituals or ceremonies. The suggested actions surprised the Dark Elves because they were used to expressing their loyalty to the king in a very formal way. However, Takuto and Atu, especially Takuto, want to change their perspective on how to show loyalty. Elder Moltar felt relieved because Takuto conveyed the same message that Elder Moltar wanted to convey, freeing him from the obligation to direct them in a formal manner. Atu explained to Elder Moltar and Gia their roles and responsibilities in managing their country each given different authority and responsibilities according to their abilities and skills. Elder Moltar was appointed as the country's manager with his magical abilities, his main role being to govern and manage the country using his expertise and magic. Gia, as the leader of the warrior maneuvers, was tasked with leading the army and protecting the country from its enemies. Takuto gave them the freedom to use their subordinates as they wished. Gia, a dark elf warrior with opposing views to the king's expectations, dreams of becoming a leader on the battlefield and defeating enemies with brutality. But the king's response revealed an unexpected preference for peace, highlighting the peaceful side of the king and affirming that he prefers peace over violence. This contradicted Gia's belief that the king would encourage destruction or war. The presence of Elder, who seemed to enjoy the situation and teasingly stroked his beard, added to Gia's confusion. Despite Gia's determination to protect, they felt confused by the king's passive attitude towards violence.
However, despite being confused by the king's peaceful demeanor, Jia remained committed to obeying the king's orders. Jia began to accept orders from Atu to take certain steps involving rest and development within their residence. Atu provided guidance on the importance of rest as an initial step towards recovery, compared to resting with a boat that appeared in the middle of the journey. This showed the importance of respecting the physical needs of the Dark Elves after a tiring experience. While Jia felt tempted to let go due to Elders' teasing, they promised themselves to rectify their mistakes later on. Jia was also frustrated with Elders' seemingly enthusiastic attitude after appearing exhausted before. Atu then offered to give orders regarding material collection and construction site selection. This was also surprising because the main character did not want to burden the already motivated Dark Elves, but the protagonist considered the unique abilities of the Dark Elf race and the importance of assigning them tasks that align with their characteristics. Takuto is considering how to improve the land without destroying the forest by taking into account the natural characteristics of the Dark Elves as forest dwellers who feel connected to their environment. He remembers that Dark Elves are a race that has a close relationship with the forest in many fantasy stories. Elves are known to be able to build without destroying the forest. The protagonist wants to make sure if the Dark Elves have similar abilities. He quickly confirms that Dark Elves, although not as strong as Light Elves, treat the forest as their home. They tend to build aerial structures using large trees and an environment that suits them better than the land. Takuto is glad to hear this because it reflects that the Dark Elves also have the same concern for the environment as the main character. This idea gives a potential solution for building structures without damaging their natural habitat. The protagonist realizes that maintaining environmental cleanliness will bring great benefits for the growth and maintenance of the Dark Elf population in the future. Gia accidentally complains that they have to destroy the forest because of the King of Destruction, while Takuto and Toad discuss with the Dark Elves. He accidentally talks about greening. This highlights the moment when Gia unintentionally reveals his ignorance about the concept of greening to Takuto. Although Gia asks honestly about Takuto's reaction, it causes confusion and surprise, especially from King Takuto, who rarely reacts openly to trivial questions. Takuto's surprised reaction and his questioning attitude towards the old Moltar's knowledge and email's knowledge about greening emphasize that the concept is unusual in their environment. When mentioning various elements of magic and magical technology that they had never heard before, it surprised them because the concept was completely beyond their reach. Even Elder Moltar's understanding trembled when mentioning various magical technologies. Elder Moltar was the only one who knew the answer to the mystery of this world's wonders, and his response indicated that it was something they had never experienced before. When Takuto tried to understand the level of magical technology and the advancing elements of the protagonist, he realized that his knowledge of magic was equivalent to that of a beginner. This shows how advanced the concept of magical technology is, to the point where the characters in the story cannot understand Gia and the heroes. The others only have limited understanding of magic, especially in a military context. This shows that their world has a huge gap in understanding more advanced technology, which causes their confusion when mentioning concepts that are far beyond their knowledge. Takuto also understands that magical technology in their world is far behind, and this is a significant gap that can provide an advantage if they can accelerate its development. When Jia asked about tree planting, Atu explained that afforestation or tree planting is done to preserve vegetation, not just for wood resources. He also mentioned that they can accelerate tree growth using magical elements, which Jia and the other characters were unaware of. Moltar and the Dark Elves admired Takuto's way of thinking that transcended time, but they also wondered where the knowledge and technology that Takuto taught them came from, proudly explaining that all knowledge was created by Ira Takuto, the great god-king of Minogra. Takuto was surprised by Atu's statement because it allowed him to control everything. Even though Takuto tried to stop his story, everyone focused on Atu's explanation, making his futile efforts continue to say that they still didn't fully understand Takuto's greatness as a king. This made the Dark Elves nod and excessively respect Tota Atu.
praised Takuto, who stated that Takuto was 100 times greater than him. Takuto tried to stop him, but the main character couldn't say the right words at the right time. Atu seemed to be playing with the situation, signaling to Takuto to ask something he didn't understand. It also seemed to take advantage of this moment to ask. The story about the plague in the Holy Kingdom of Qualia, which according to the priest was caused by a demon curse, but quickly clarified that it was actually caused by cat hunting in the city, which caused the rat population to increase significantly. His answer implied that the story of the demon curse only spread due to a lack of understanding of the actual conditions when talking about the origin of the plague and linking it to rats. He described the bacteria as invisible creatures, giving an analogy of how to deal with it like eliminating worms in the body. Although Takuto did not directly convey the information, Atu implied that this was a discovery made by the king, indicating that he had a deep understanding of health issues and epidemics. Although not explicitly stating his knowledge, Takuto himself did not find the information. Takuto respects the figure who discovered the truth before the elf girls divert the conversation to another topic, talking about the fruits created by Takuto. He highlights various modern products that he has created. Although the dark elves do not understand how it happens, they appreciate the technological ability to produce abundant food and fruits. Takuto follows the conversation with joy, although the main character is somewhat worried about it, due to the excessive enthusiasm for the topic. When Atu expresses his liking for wine, Takuto intends to limit the consumption of wine for the time being. However, Atu is already too excited and unaware that Takuto has feelings about it. The elf girl enthusiastically talks about the seeds planted by her without informing Takuto and without permission from the king. This surprises and slightly angers everyone. It is inappropriate to do so without permission. Although Takuto is involved in the conversation, he is actually more focused on the results of planting the seeds. Takuto realizes that his ability to create high-quality food also means that the main character has the potential to create other resources. In this case, Takuto explores the possibility of using a large amount of magic power to forcibly create rare resources. The main character realizes that unlimited magical powers can be used to secure resources without worrying about their availability. This opens up opportunities for maneuvers to become stronger than others in a way that would not be possible without Takuto's presence as the Takuto King. Takuto realizes that first and foremost, the main character must prioritize the well-being of his people. This triggers his thoughts and plans for the future strategy of his nation which is constantly flowing with information in his mind. An unusual smile is carved on his face, showing rare excitement. Atu, who also understands what Takuto has discovered, smiles and chuckles when interrupted by Amal, who asks if it is forbidden to take praise for what Amal has done. Finally, the fear is relieved and the positive response seems to be going smoothly, while still remaining enthusiastic, starting to revise future national management policies. This section explains the geographical and political context of the Idorogia continent, introducing two main countries, the Holy Kingdom of Qualia, dominated by the human race, and the Elen Federation, ruled by the Elven species. Although both countries have cultural differences and possible tensions, they enjoy a level of prosperity. However, it is not entirely clear whether a harmonious relationship has been achieved between them in the northern province of the Holy Kingdom. Qualia is located in the least developed area among their countries. There are farming villages and fishing villages scattered there with low value. A girl dressed in white seems to have an important role as she looks at the snowy ground. The girl is called by the knights who signal to her. The presence of a group of snow goblins, consisting of several thousand members, suddenly invades and destroys the villages, claiming many lives. This is a significant threat, especially when there is only one person trying to stop them. A 17-year-old girl known as the Holy Lady Soalina, also known as the Funeral Flower. Soalina is considered one of the seven great savior saints on the continent of Idorogia. She is the embodiment of magic and is respected as the guardian of the world. Her graceful nature with flowers all over her body gives her extraordinary power. Soalina's aura tries to communicate with the snow goblins, speaking of the suffering of many innocent people, 
and expressing hope for peace. However, as the threat from the snow goblins gets closer, the situation becomes more intense. Lady Soelina uses her magical powers to stop the invasion of the snow goblins in the northern region of the Holy Kingdom. She summons the Serene Fire, destroying the snow goblins and reducing them to ashes on the battlefield in a dramatic and powerful scene. Lady Soelina faces the threat with incredible strength, as the fire she produces destroys the snow goblins and everything around them. Although the powerful Holy Knights survive, they are also affected by the heat generated by the fire. After the fire's power subsides, the atmosphere becomes silent. No one talks about this extraordinary event, but shortly after, flowers suddenly appear and bloom above them. The burning flowers in this war memorial symbolize respect for those who have passed away and completed the funeral atmosphere like Seo Soalina, then asked Cardinal to send the Holy Knights to investigate the signs of disaster in the southern region of the continent outside the area. The Holy Kingdom of Seo Saena, despite having extraordinary magical powers, found itself in a difficult situation due to its limited position. So Alina wants to act on her own without mobilizing the Holy Knight forces, but she is restrained by Cardinal who shows his concern for the importance of her position. In the kingdom, there is an internal conflict where SEO feels trapped by expectations and judgments of its position, but Soelina also has a strong desire to act and help without being hindered by formal power. Soelina's cool attitude towards Cardinal's insults shows that she prefers to maintain her composure rather than respond emotionally to words. Soelina seems more interested in viewing the situation philosophically rather than getting involved in a pointless conflict. In the end, Cardinal offers an alternative to resolve the situation. And even though Soelina agreed with a small smile, she still felt alienated. And the previously disapproving Cardinal's loneliness slowly understood and retreated from Seo's mind, even though Seo continued to show strong dedication to protecting those around him and praying for their safety. Big changes also occurred in the world of the Great Curse, where Takuto and the others, who were previously considered newcomers, have just started to build their power and position, now seeing significant progress. There is appreciation for the efforts and development of the Dark Elves, and although the buildings they produce may seem simple, they imply great progress in building a nation. This simple table conference may be a turning point for Takuto and his team. Even though they started from a humble position, they now face the opportunity to build something greater beyond themselves. Previous expectations and predictions underline the vision of Takuto in building his monarchical country, with the aim of improving the welfare of his people. The main character focuses on accumulating magical power through a system that collects contributions from the citizens. Although there are some controversial systems such as forced collection that forcibly confiscates the mystical power of the people. However, Takuto remains determined to ensure the happiness of his people as the main foundation in nation building, considering food production as a priority. Takuto provides a perspective that considers logistics and practicality in the development of his territory. Their discussion highlights the importance of infrastructure and food production in ensuring the prosperity and security of the country, even with the magical power that Takuto possesses. When he gave the old Moltar tree seeds, which seemed quite strange, Atu didn't seem to care too much about the reaction and casually gave the seeds. Experienced individuals in this world have limitations in identifying the types of trees from the seeds given to them, even though these seeds are different from the ones planted by Amal and Jia, who are other individuals receiving similar instructions from Atu. The seeds seem to have unique characteristics that make them difficult to identify, but proudly convey that the seeds will grow into what is called a human flesh tree. This expression feels strange and surprising to the old Moltar in its attempt to understand this strange plant. The old Moltar is asked to explain in more detail the characteristics and uses of this plant, to explain that in their civilization, this plant is one of the means of food production that produces mysterious meat that tastes like human flesh. This explanation makes the old Moltar worried and feel that it sounds evil. The old Moltar is worried about how people will react to a plant with such properties. At the same time, the king, who is experiencing communication disturbances, steps in to provide further explanation. Although he looks tired, 
The king tries to understand the old Moltar's concerns, especially regarding how society will respond to a plant that produces meat similar to humans. The main character also realizes that people's preferences will vary, and the presence of a plant that produces meat similar to humans can cause damage. The Holy Kingdom of Quoria has a paladin, which is a position belonging to someone who is in charge of carrying out missions about religion. Although under the Saintess, they are elite troops who are smart and tough, and can use super-divine power. Paladins are also very popular and trusted by the people of Kuoria. Yesterday, the armed forces used to work to solve internal problem tasks in various corners of this country. By considering the seriousness of the problem, two paladins have been ordered to lead a team of mercenaries for this matter. There was a holy god, Eros, who asked to be blessed on the journey to be undertaken. Getting a request to serve as a team of investigators regarding the prophecy of a disaster in a very cursed land from the Sanintes Soaria. Leonius, who still prays endlessly so that his journey can arrive safely without any adversity. Leonis thought that there must be some influence coming from the unrest in the north, otherwise it would be impossible for them to dispatch a team of investigators of this size. The sudden decrease in combat power made Velder included in this. At first, only a few people were going to be dispatched. Even the soldiers were not from the country. No idea how he managed to hire these soldiers. Velder said it could now be proven that Quoria had no money and not to worry about such things. After all, the one who gathered more than fifty soldiers was himself. He has a rude attitude and does not know how to behave. As a stargazer and devout follower of the gods, his attitude was not commendable. Because the Suarina was the overseer of a major part of the highly contested land disputes in the southern part of the Idraja continent, which was the task of the southern regional legislature, this was the perfect time to ascertain the situation on the undeveloped black continent but they were sure it would be chaotic. If the mission of inquiry was a success, it would also be an achievement for Velder. If the mission failed, it would be Leonis's responsibility as a lowly paladin who was not supported by good social status. Even so, he remains a high-level paladin who cannot be underestimated by anyone. It is undeniable that this paladin's chance of life increases because of this. This is also the will of the gods. There was someone who informed that the situation had become serious. There are some soldiers who do not participate even though the pay is expensive. The reason for this is because it concerns their lives and the conditions there are quite difficult. Soldiers who are paid will be forced to work hard. If we are not maximized, we will definitely be affected. They also talked about the female witch, Litala or Dono. The human flesh tree has grown according to plan. Therefore. The production of food for the citizens of the Minogra Kingdom has been secured. In addition, food production has begun. The facilities there are running very well, based on previous observations. The results of several months of work had paid off. In accordance with the plan after the construction of residential settlements is completed, then the construction of the palace will be hastened. But the condition of the forest looks different. This forest is proof that this land is Minogra territory. This place is said to have become a cursed land. All people have become citizens of Minogra, so you have become an evil existence. The changes that will be experienced due to the king's power are not only the citizens, but also the land where the citizens live will react. This land becomes a land that is beyond profitable. The existence of evil and harming good existence as a form of defense. When she entered the forest, the woman didn't feel anything. After breathing slowly, then she began to feel an extraordinary freshness. Naturally, changes in oneself are difficult to realize directly. But there was one problem. The forest was very clearly very striking from most forests. A bar at the last stop town. They have reached the last stop town. Relax for a while and enjoy the warm meal that had been served. Leonis said that in the end they couldn't do enough research. The closer, the darker, and less life-sustaining the human population, the smaller the human population. Cruel, barbaric tribes, poisonous soil, and diseases of unknown origin. There are many things that are quite worrying for Leonis, who must remain brave. A paladin can drink sake. The god has said that he will give respite to his servant who has completed a difficult task. 
The third teaching of the God of Eros is part four, number three. What is meant there is leniency in carrying out family obligations after performing holy duties. There is no part that is allowed to drink sake. It turns out that Mr. Velder's understanding with Leonis was different. It seems they needed a holy debate for the next time. Speaking of saintess prophecies, what exactly will happen to this cursed land? For us, trust is number one. We will not sell information that should not be disseminated. This is related to the witch. Actually, the witch that was talked about during the departure that was reportedly the cause of the chaos in the north came from the witch. They thought it referred to a group of ancient magical creatures, but this time the interpretation was different. Although Bargio wanted to confirm it, now he couldn't contact his acquaintances who were there anymore. So, this was a figure that the mercenary couldn't recognize through the information seller, though. There is something to be worried about right now, and that is the possibility of a threat whose power is equal to the cause of the chaos in the north that resides in the cursed land. Master Velder sees the possibility of the witch in the far reaches. Master Velder already had a plan in place. The cursed land was where the dark elves had fled. Master Velder had calculated that they might cause trouble. Leonis was curious about the dark elves that Master Velder had mentioned. Bargio also heard that the dark elves had been expelled from El Nassar, but they were instead in a cursed land. Possessing the skill of killing with curses, it is possible that the dark elves are part of the rumors of the witch. Master Velder used to face the curse Sage Mortiel and Assassin Gia, whose abilities were comparable to his big name as well. In this command, we are required to deal with it thoroughly. Even if the witch will appear, don't provoke it. Then if the situation is dangerous, then all those here must immediately flee. The great power is only a matter of time, until when that time comes, they attack two countries, namely Quoria and Elnar. If they run into the witch one day, many innocent people will be victimized. We are paladins, said Leonis to Velder. As paladins, what we should do is to eradicate the evil and danger that will threaten human life. Velder explained to Leonis that loyal followers of the gods like himself, there are times when they choose to risk their lives. There are also times when they have no choice but to face a crime themselves. Velder and Leonis should have a reason not to die. That could apply to everyone here. Velder emphasized that young people like Leonis tend not to have much experience. If he's only aiming for what's in front of him, then that's a big mistake that Leonis has made. Leonis wanted to refute the conversation, but the woman beside him asked him to joke around. Leonis asked the god Eros to give his participation to all of them. At that time, Leonis saw the barbarian-like inhabitants of the dark continent of the Hill Giant. The area is indeed full of dangerous creatures. Leonis did not expect that his arrival would be greeted directly by the enemy who made them mobilize all troops after entering this continent. Even if it's just an ogre class, I'm alone enough to defeat it. Lord Velder shouted for Leonius to help him with his troubles. Leonius ordered the soldiers to stand guard with his crossbow. Fed up with the slow movement of his warriors, it was Velder who stepped in to finish things off. Leonius was worried about Velder who was advancing alone. Before fighting his enemy, Velder first asked for a prayer to the gods to give him the strength to eradicate the evil that would come to him. After praying, Velder starts the action to attack first by using the sacred sword technique that has been preached. His movements have contained prayers to the gods. With the power of the gods, his body was strengthened. It was a secret quaria technique. In addition to increasing the ability to fight, this technique has a special impact if used to fight evil. The attack is fierce enough to defeat the enemy. Velder will continue to fight even though his body is that big. As soon as possible, they had to move quickly before the smell of blood invited other creatures to come to this place. Leonius praised Master Velder for being so good at fighting. Velder believes that with the power he has, he can solve any problem. At that time, there was a child named Takuto. Everything can go well according to the expectations that have been desired. Takuto was very worried if this experiment failed again. Takuto did not think that normal production could be done only by channeling magic energy into food ingredients and other resources needed. If you think of this production method in the game, it seems like it would be an interesting thing. 
The thing that was produced was the long leg insect. The hero unit that Takuto will produce next is a unit that can increase in strength continuously, the predecessor of all existing insects. According to Etherpedia, flocking units require the best resident population. This is very different from the units made now. Moreover, they can also upgrade themselves. The personality of animals other than Sela from other units is very severe. When the time has come, Takuto wants to deploy the scouts used to keep watch. A step like this is a precautionary measure if someday the town around here realizes the impact of the cursed land. Now we are busy with the development stage. Takuto wants to make this country a safe country when they want to take a break in the future. Then he will make the next policy by considering the people's opinions. Takuto has been talking about this since the beginning. He wanted to live in a peaceful country with the people he loved. A shocking information that a group of armed forces will head to the forest. Takuto is very uneasy about their presence. Takuto just wants his life to be peaceful. The enemy is approaching the area of Takuto and his friends. Velder's troops had spotted a cursed forest that allowed no life in it. The land is also very cursed. The man read out a travel map. If they all continued traveling straight from the current position, then it would be easier to reach the northernmost part of the forest. Then suggested to Leonius to investigate the area around this forest first. The cursed land was a vast forest. They lacked the time and energy to investigate all parts of it. However, the investigation was only to find out whether or not there was anything strange going on. Conducting a simple investigation was also not a big problem. According to Leonis, this was an easy mission, and there was no need to take a detour. They eventually agreed to that. Velder suspected something in that direction. Velder told Leonius to stop before doing the Askinya. Someone came towards them wearing a black cloak. Leonius saw that the person looked like a girl. She was probably part of the dark elves that Master Velder had predicted yesterday. Leonis was also surprised to see this girl walking in this difficult terrain, and the girl was very lucky that she was still able to survive well. They all questioned who the girl was, who had come out in a cursed land like this. That girl was an evil witch. She seemed quiet and seemed like a good person, but the truth was that the paladins would be the target of the woman to be killed. He repeatedly warned against entering the cursed forest. Velder and the troops were still trying and would not give up so easily to surrender themselves to the Holy Kingdom. This could be considered a cowardly act that dared not take any action. Velder, as the leader of the troops, did not want to be considered crumbs by people, especially the woman who kept blocking Velder's intention to plan something in the cursed forest. The girl knew that they were people from the paladins. Then she explained that she was a dark elf who had escaped to the forest area, the girl asked the paladins about their purpose for coming to this cursed place. Velder would not answer her question until she answered his first. The girl emphasized that this place was a cursed place, with no life in the forest. It was unexpected that her arrival using a weapon lived in the cursed land, said Velder. Velder also told her that he had a business in the forest. The girl did not allow Velder to enter the forest and immediately canceled the intention of the paladins who wanted to enter the forest. Velder argued that this action was a divine decree. If the girl refused, the paladins would revolt. Velder was angry when Leonius interrupted him. Velder thinks that Leonius is not fit to be a paladin, and he will report Leonius' behavior to the center. The girl kept asking them not to enter the forest. Velder was angry because he was prevented from entering, and suspected that there was something in the forest. There was only peace and quiet in this forest. The girl thought that Velder was very interested in the small, dark forest. The arrival of Velder and his troops to the forest was due to a prophecy of disaster in this land. Therefore, Velder would not go home empty-handed. Leonius, who also felt annoyed, shouted that this friendly and mission was very secret, but he easily leaked it in front of the girl. Velder had revealed state secrets to people who could possibly be involved with an evil group. This was a sin of treason for which he could be punished. The paladins were anxious about the coming disaster. In this land there are no dangerous creatures that can create disasters like those in the minds of Velder and other paladins. 
A very annoyed look came over the girl's face. The paladins had traveled a long and difficult and hard journey. Having just reached the cursed forest, the girl easily told the paladins to go back, even though the paladins had just gotten the peaceful land they craved. Velder said the girl was still like a child but had learned to speak. Evelder had been negotiating too much. If this was too much, then Velder would do something. With a bow of her head, the girl stated that this was not an existence that could endanger the paladins. From distant observation, Leonias thought the girl had little in the way of evil. It was unlikely she was a dark elf. Velder wanted to ask the girl to swear an oath in the name of the gods on this matter. Then the girl also swore in the name of their god. Leonias really wanted to go home when he heard the oath. Leonias knew that if the girl only wanted a peaceful life, with that understanding, Leonias would go home right now. That girl has a different aura. So the result of the investigation this time was that there was no problem whatsoever. He was trying to fool her. If he brought disaster to the Holy Kingdom, then how would he be held responsible? Velder stood silently and reminded Leonius not to speak with mixed emotions in his opinions. Leonius even suspected Velder of having kidnapped an innocent girl and then molested her. It could be that Velder was flirting with the girl. Master Velder clarified the words of Leonius that it was just a gossip that was not based on facts. After all, Leonius laconically discussed such things in front of many people. All the actions and deeds of Master Velder so far hint at a crime that has been hidden for a long time. An attitude and behavior made Leonius convinced of this. Velder and Leonius were arguing together because they were not on the same page. The girl asked to stop the fighting that was going on. Fights like this don't lead to anything. Suddenly, Leonius pointed his sword at Velder. He asked Velder to be quiet and threatened to arrest him for interrogation in the capital later. Velder also attacked Leonius and was injured. Blood flowed as a result of Velder's attack. The witch is a disaster in person. Life is indeed something that cannot run smoothly. Only a foolish person would make the fatal decision to investigate in the face of a disaster. The situation had already begun to get more chaotic. The woman who was alone wearing the robe changed into her true form, who had evil intentions for Velder's actions and his troops. The witch woman was excessively furious at all the events that were happening. Therefore, she took action to be able to attack the paladins one by one with her own hands. The paladins in this condition could not do much except to attack the witch using the weapons that had been prepared since the beginning of their departure. Velder ordered the soldiers to prepare their bows. The soldiers began to shoot the witch woman one by one, but it was unfortunate that the woman had dodged many arrows. Velder was previously ordered to keep it a secret. It was not felt that Velder should talk about the witch. In the prophecy given by the Saintess, there will be a disaster coming to the country of monsters. They are also the ones who will cause chaos in the north, namely the witches, and have so far confirmed two people. It was likely that the girl was the third. The woman of the witch was very fierce. She wouldn't let the Pladen wound her alone against many people. She unleashed her ability and strength to finish off the paladins who had caused unrest in the cursed forest. The paladins also did not want to lose to the witch alone. They continue to do what Master Velder has ordered. A disaster in the north that the Quaria Holy Nation's proud army and saintesses could not seem to overcome was caused by an individual. The mercenaries were prepared to provide assistance only. Velder ordered the soldiers to follow Leonius. The attack had been going on for quite some time. Perhaps this attack resulted in something unexpected. Velder managed to cut off the woman's tail, causing her to bleed. But the woman was still fine and not in any pain at all. Velder wasn't going to waste this opportunity. The woman didn't stay still, so she brought out two giant monsters and ordered the paladins to injure the two monsters. Velder asked Leonius not to be easily provoked by the monsters that had been released. The woman who comes from the witch is very dangerous. She can do what she wants, especially preying on one of the paladins in the kneeling forest. Two more attacks would take place against the witch woman. Therefore, Velder requested that Leonius restrain his burning emotions. The witch woman was astonished that the paladins were still advancing on her. Even though she had used a valuable fellow paladin as her shield, the life of a warrior is precious and important to fight for.
The soul of a human being is high. The woman maliciously wounded Velder and stabbed him in the head, hands and stomach until he bled. The other troops could no longer move with the evil done by the witch woman. One of her targets is Velder, because he has opposed many actions that are prohibited from going to the cursed land just to carry out the mission of a disaster prophecy that does not know the truth and facts. The journey of Velder and Leonius and the soldiers of this clan did not produce good results. They all died in vain just by fighting a great witch with her magic power. The stupidity of this has already happened and took its toll. Leonius was silent as he watched the tortured Velder. All of the tentacles should have been severed, but they fused back together nicely. The woman had more than six tentacles that she could use whenever and wherever. The paladin warriors began to worry. If Lord Velder had been defeated, then it would be Leonius's turn, and the last would be the soldiers. The paladins who already knew about it immediately ran to get away from the scary place. Leonius said to ask the paladin soldiers to split up from each other, stay alive even if it's just one person, and then tell this to the country. The woman would not let them all leave this forest. Leonius, who knew that the woman had targeted his soldiers, a hepta object can be owned by the woman. Leonius was only stunned to see her, then she attacked him quickly. The woman had taken over the sword of one of the paladins and made it her own. The witch was great with killing, she could control what was in the victim's mind. Even Velder could know many things, because he managed to master Velder who had died covered in blood due to a deadly attack. The woman who had taken Velder's sword skills. Apparently, Velder the Paladin is a fearless fighter with capacities and abilities that are comparable to his name. Along with her sword skills, the woman also captured Velder's memories. The brave and intelligent man seemed to die easily without a long thought. The woman also knew that Leonius had a family consisting of a wife named Masra and a child named Mina who had just been born. Leonius was shocked that he knew everything about his small family. Witches know that very easily. All the abilities and knowledge of the person killed by the witch will be taken by her. So that woman knows about Leonius because she has taken it from Velder's body. In fact, Leonius had once spoken to Velder about his little exit. Leonius had thought that if the witch woman killed more and more, the more power. If only Leonius died by her, something would happen to Leonius's family. Besides that, the fate of mercenaries and other people were waiting for Leonius. The same Velder who had been with Leonius and the other soldiers had died this time. 